Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. A very warm welcome to Meet Menaka. Today, we are going to be discussing preventing and screening cancer, the episode 108 with Dr. Shivan Shivakumar, who is a consultant medical oncologist at University of Oxford. A very warm welcome to you first, Dr. Shivakumar. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. So let me introduce the talk show first. Meet Medica talk show features experts in their respective fields, like today, and also real people sharing real stories to create a positive social change. Our mission is to touch 1 million lives to improve health, happiness, and hope. So it is a vibrant 90-minute multicultural online talk show to celebrate each and every one of you. We would be delighted to have you join our show for the live stream airing every Sunday at two o'clock London time. I know I'm aware the time has changed in Canada, US and um, in Sri Lanka, India, in Asia as well. So please note your time has changed definitely in Sri Lanka and India. It will be 7.30 in the evening rather than 6.30 from last week. You can join our event by uh, registering with the link we sh usually share on all the social medias. If not, please um, write to us on meetatmenaka.co and we will be able to send you the link as well. So thank you so much for supporting us to cross the 100 shows mark. We have been announcing recently that on the 3rd of December, we will be having our first in-person event. Hopefully, we will be able to see many of you in person who we haven't been able to see so far. And it's going to be a great event with some awards, book launch, and some dinner and dance and socializing and networking. So hoping to see you, see many of you there. Please support our YouTube channel, Meet Menaka. You can get the library of resources of all the old shows there, which from finance to all different health issues to inspirational talks, everything is there. So hopefully you will make use of that. So why are we talking about preventing and screening cancer today? Prevention is definitely better than in intervention or cure. But to detect early, there are many different screen tests available in the UK and the NHS and in other parts of the world, it could be available in other modes. But some of the precautions that is within our control as much as my limited knowledge goes, is stop smoking, eat healthy, have a monitor your weight, drink alcohol consciously or moderately, and uh, limit the processed food. But we have an expert today to come and tell all about how to prevent, how we can intervene early and di get diagnosed early, and also to make sure how someone can manage or support if it is a family or friend. Let me talk very briefly about Dr. Shivan Shivakumar today. Dr. Shivan Shivakumar is a consultant medical oncologist at University of Oxford. He's a cancer specialist in treating tumors of the pancreas and liver with a research interest in detecting and treating pancreatic cancer. So really humbled and honored to have you. And I know you're a very, very busy consultant. So appreciate you dedicating the time to come, and come on our show and uh, help our audience. Thank you. To begin with, can you tell us, can cancer be prevented? If so, what are the main preventable uh, causes of cancer? Sure, no, thank you. Um, so really, I mean, as long as we're alive and we're being humans, we're always going to get cancer. So one, two of us in our lifetimes will get cancer in some form. We know about 40% of cancers in the developed world could have some form of prevention associated with them, with at least 20% related to smoking. So that's one in five cancers related to smoking with another one in 20 related to being 
either weight or obese, as they flu. And there are other cancers related to infections, alcohol, um, increased UV exposure, which probably isn't applicable to most of us. Um, but we know that there is a significant proportion of cancers that can be um, prevented. And we've already touched on the fact that, you know, good lifestyle measures that are applicable for human disease in general um, should be really um, the key here. So, you know, not smoking, eating healthily, uh, trying to remain a healthy body weight. Um, moderate with um, alcohol or minimal amounts of alcohol and um, yeah that's, that would then help actually prevent a significant amount of health cancer but that being said um, with all the best will in the world you know there are still a significant amount of cancers that even if you do live a healthy life uh, they seem to be inevitable that you will get them Thank you, Dr. Shivakumar. We have spoken about prevention. Unfortunately, like you said, sometimes it's not preventable. It does happen. But can early detection truly make a difference to patients? Yes. So, um, sorry, I saw a comment about my volume being too low, so I'll come a bit closer to my computer screen. Um, so, in general, when we talk about cancers we have um different stages of cancer so most of the audience will be familiar about the fact that we have stage one two three and four with stage one and two being the fact that the cancer is small and confined to an organ um with stage three still being confined but it's invaded local structures called lymph nodes and stage four being what we call metastatic disease, so disease that spread to distant sites. And when cancer has spread, this is deemed incurable. Okay. So, you know, with that in mind, early detection, early diagnosis, I think is 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 key. So if I give you the example of colorectal cancer, which is a common cancer that affects um majority of us you know in the cancer world we talk about a metric called the five-year survival so this is a percentage of people who are alive at five years so stage four colorectal cancer patients on the whole will probably you know there'll be, there'll be somewhere between a 10 to 20 percent five-year survival if you detect at stage one, stage two, that goes up to about 95%. Okay. So, you know, we could see that paradigm go across many other cancers as well. So detecting early means that the cancer is confined and surgery and maybe some form of systemic therapy would be the best way of curing patients. Thank you so much for that. You talked about colorectal cancer. There are other cancers. Which cancers have early detection or screening programs? So in the UK in particular, there are three cancers um, where there are early detection programs. So I touched on colorectal, breast cancer, and cervical cancer. Um, the UK government have recently introduced um, the go-ahead for screening for lung cancer, uh, but I don't think that's, that's started just yet. Because that announcement was only made a few weeks ago, but those three cancers, um, we know that if you comply in screening, there's a decent chance that if you were to have cancer, they could be picked up early and your prognosis would be better. So I'm listening to you. Is it because some of the screenings are approved mainly because it is beneficial and others might not make a difference? Yes. So, I'm just uh, trying to understand. Yeah, so you've actually touched on a very complicated um, you know, topic 
be fair. So, um, sorry, I've now had a comment about increased lighting, but I don't actually <laughs> in this room. But um, so you've touched on a very complicated topic there, which is that does necessarily early detection help save lives? And it is a very complicated topic. There's a lot of research on it. So we know in some cancers such as cervical cancer and in uh, colorectal cancer that actually detecting it early definitely does save lives. Um, we know that the breast cancer screening program is actually very controversial in terms, well, not to the general public, but actually to the medical research community because um, we know that detecting breast cancer early does help, um, you know, with survival. But the other issue is that a lot of these breast cancers that we're picking up may never actually kill a person in the first place. And we may be doing more harm than good by actually picking up quite a few of these cancers. Sure, thank you so much. Because as a family or a loved one, People are always thinking, you know, if there was screening, if it was detected early, uh, the lifespan could have been better or life quality of life could have been better for someone. Um, it's always a debatable question if whenever when people start, because I know as a from medical uh, background, there's nice guidelines. It's not only just health, it's, there are other implications uh, which is on play. I just thought listening to you, I'll ask that question. Thank you so much, Dr. Shukla. Nothing or no subject goes past COVID these days. So do you think COVID has had an impact on cancer services? So quite simply, yes. Um, it's had a huge effect in many ways. So I think just as simple as the fact that patients and People are just struggling to access um, their GP. They're struggling to um, access secondary care and imaging. So people are putting off presenting to their doctors with their symptoms because they're, they're just finding it very hard to access people. And the, the waiting times, um, just to get very straightforward, tests seem to have increased. Uh, part of that is COVID, part of that is unfortunately just general um, demand for healthcare services and the, the current issues we're going through with the NHS. Um, we know that uh, we did a piece of work actually earlier on this year where we looked at pancreatic cancer survival in our region. And as you know, pancreatic cancer is a disease that has a very poor survival and you know during and after the COVID period the survival of these patients had halved so you know we were talking about people who on average have about three to six months but actually because of issues with the you know seeing their GP and actually having access to surgery and chemotherapy this had you know, almost half their survival, which, and a lot of that result was, could probably be put down to COVID and those lockdowns. Yes, I think almost all services have been affected. This is, it. like you said, it's, you know, I'm sure cancer treatment uh, or cancer services is no different, but the consequences perhaps could be a bit more dire in certain services than others. So thank you so much for enlightening that. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Um, but I think the difference there is that we are talking about life. So um, if there is an impact of not being diagnosed uh, quick enough, you're talking about, you know, reduced um, survival, but also, as you said, reduced quality of life um, as well. Sure. Thank you. So what is the value on getting CT scans to detect cancer early or these days, even MRIs are happening? Because 
it's important, isn't it, for um, the general public to be able to make that decision? Yeah. Well, I think we're seeing this more and more um, in the developed world where, um, so in the NHS, you can't get a whole body CT or MRI um, done, but private providers do provide the service because it's a fee paying service. And, you know, uh, I think that the general public in general and our communities in general um, are now starting to, you know, health has become such an important part of our lives and we're doing a lot more to be um, healthier. Uh, but even still, I think a lot of people are appreciating the fact that if they could do an extra measure to ensure that they could spot cancer earlier, such as paying for a private CT or paying for a private MRI, this may end up um, catching cancer earlier. And I think this is going to become a big growth market over the next few years. But, um, you know, as well as potential pros, I think that there are some very significant cons to this method. Um, you know, you may by chance spot a cancer early, get it cut out, and that may save your life. Um, and there is a very real prospect of that. Um, we haven't really got this sort of information at a population level, but as an individual, you could imagine that you would have some sort of reassurance if you were 50 or 55 um, and you had a normal CT scan. Um, that being said, you know, the human body is a very interesting biological entity and there are lumps growing in us all the time. And the reality is most things, lumps and bumps, are probably not cancer. And it will take a considerable amount of time and effort to actually go and you know, diagnose these and, you know, find out exactly what these lumps and bumps are. And, you know, this would cause inevitable um, stress and anxiety for many people. Um, and there are still some people who would want to go through with that process, but I mean, that is the danger of, of actually scanning yourself um, regularly, which is the fact that if you don't have cancer, you may put yourself through lots of unnecessary investigations. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think, and also some investigation which could be harmful in some way. Is it that that's perhaps the point? Um, if if you are going to go through investigations and you know it's only a matter of money, which is also important, but that's one thing. But if it is in instead, it's um, harmful to your health for which purpose you're first you know firstly going for that is uh, really important to know i can take it yeah. thank you dr shukumar so yes we have spoken about cti ct scans or mris or you know those kind of things so are there other new methods to potentially catch cancer earlier which perhaps not that invasive or not that harmful so I think really, you know, today, the trying to catch cancer early is the biggest, um, you know, the biggest area of medical research and inquiry in the cancer field, um, for all the reasons we mentioned earlier. And I think the, the area that lots of people have got really excited about and something that's coming you know into the clinic well in north america it has come into the clinic is this concept of something we call circulating tumor dna and so just very simply dna is the building block of life it's what makes us and cancers themselves have their own dna that's unique from ourselves and cancers um, can actually secrete DNA 
into our own bloodstreams. So there are newer methods to actually pick up this DNA and actually try and identify um, cancer early. So you know, probably the, the new story that many in the UK have, have read in the last few months is from a company called Grail, which is running the biggest early detection um, tumor, circulating tumor DNA study in the country called, um, it's, their test is called the Galeri test and they're running the Galeri trial. And it hopes to pick up 50 different types of cancer. And this product, as I said, is already available in North America. And the idea is, is that it could pick up microscopic amounts of tumor DNA in a person's bloodstream and not only identify, you know, that you have cancer, but the whole idea is, is that it identifies in which organ you have cancer from, um, which would be quite interesting and exciting to see if that, that, that is definitely the case or not. Um, I think that there are some interesting data that it can definitely pick up cancer, but um, you know, I don't know how accurate the test is, and I think that the next few years will really give a give some sort of indication on if this is going to be the way that we pick up patients' cancers earlier. Thank you so much. I don't think there's anyone better to ask this uh, other than you, because I know you have a special interest and in part of the research, if I'm right. Uh, so I thought, you know, you would be able to tell us more. Yeah, so we, yeah, no, thank you. So we we have actually, you know, as I said, I've got a very big interest in pancreatic cancer, which is, you know, called the silent killer. Um, because by the time we have symptoms, normally it's far too late for a patient. So we've done quite a bit of work using circulating tumor DNA to pick up earlier stage disease so patients can get an operation. And I mean, in a, in a, you know, we've only done these studies in 20, 30 patients, but it's, you know, you can see from a three milliliter um, blood test, which is, you know, probably just more than a tablespoon, that you can pick up pancreatic cancers, which are, are only one to two centimeters. We're now doing those studies in much bigger, pa bigger patient sample sizes. I think the issue we're generally having is would you really be rolling out um, a test like that to the general population? Or, a cancer that affects 10,000 patients. But um, there is also a lot of interesting work now that ourselves and others have done to show that actually one of the first presentations of pancreatic cancer in a significant number of patients is diabetes and impaired blood glucose, um, which I think you've talked about in previous shows. And um, I think really, you know, what we would like to see in the future um, with circulated tumor DNA, at least in the context of pancreatic cancer, is for all new diabetes patients uh, to have those tests done. Thank you, Dr. Shakura. Really helpful because whether we like it or not, cancer is becoming more and more common or we are becoming aware of it. Um, you know, it could be two things. I think so. It is important for everyone to sit up and listen and pay attention to this, I think. Absolutely. So can you tell us about cancer immunotherapy? Because it is something relatively new. And um, is it important in all cancers? And what role does it really play? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of the audience are probably aware of um, immunotherapy for cancer. I mean, it's a question that every patient asks me. 
it's a very new type of treatment for cancer. Um, it's so new, it only won the Nobel Prize three years ago. Um, so quite simply, um, you know, with, um, you know, cancers, they actually artificially put um, a sort of blocking signal on a patient's own immune system. So as the audience knows, the immune system is the way that we fight infections and cancers and other diseases. So it's our own sort of army against disease. So cancer has been very clever to essentially evade the immune system and put a block. And what it was, so when we specifically talk about cancer immunotherapy, um, what it was is several years ago, some incredibly clever immunologists discovered this um, stopping signal that the cancers were putting on the immune system. And they developed drugs to, to essentially knock out that stopping signal. So the immune system could, um, could essentially attack and kill the cancer. And this has been transformative in several cancers. Um, and you know, the cancers that it has had the most effect on is the cancers that would have developed quite a strong immune response. So these are cancers which are normally caused by, um, you know, a lot of UV radiation or smoking or infections. So, um, so cancers like melanoma, lung cancer, esophageal cancer, um, they've actually seen quite a large change in how we practice with immunotherapy. And that, I think what's really significant is in these cancers with stage four disease, patients could actually be completely cured or cleared of all their disease. But this, this is a very small but significant subset of patients. Um, you know, with the main cancer I treat, pancreatic cancer, immunotherapy hasn't had um, that much of a, a role because it's not a cancer that's dominated by lots of mutations. Um, but uh, that's essentially what immunotherapy is. Now, um, I think another interesting thing about immunotherapy that I think the, the audience might find interesting or oh, I hope they find interesting, is that we all know about um, the side effects of chemo chemotherapy, and it's something that a lot of people are, are naturally rightly scared of, um, where they get fatigue, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and the risk of infections. What's really interesting about immunotherapy and with cancer patients is that most people don't seem to develop any side effects. But when they do develop side effects, because it's, it's a result of the immune system attacking your own body because you've taken off the blocking signal. So we, you know, I was there as a junior doctor when immunotherapy um, was coming online. And we were seeing patients who were being cleared of their cancers that started developing what we call autoimmune side effects. So we saw patients started developing hepatitis, thyroiditis, um, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, um, even arthritis, which was very interesting. So it's, it's a very different pattern of, of side effects. But as I said, most people don't get any. Thank you so much, Dr. Shirkar. I know one of your special interests is liver cancer. Yeah. Tell us a bit about the liver cancer because as an expert, I'm sure we will learn a lot from you. And also, can it be picked up early? Yeah. 
So um, no, thank you for the question. So broadly speaking, there's two different types of liver cancer. So there's cancer of the, the main liver itself, which we call hepatocellular carcinoma. And there is a cancer of what we call the biliary tract, which is effectively the sort of sewage system of the liver, which is where all the different um, sorts of hormones and chemicals um, you know, get drained out. And there is, um, you know, the cancers behave very differently. So the biliary tract cancers, unfortunately, are quite similar to pancreatic cancer, where actually it's very hard to predict who gets them and who will, um, you know, do, do well from therapy. But the hepatocellular carcinoma is actually one of the most commonest cancers in the world right now. And that's mainly due to the result of the fact that the main mechanism of getting hepatocellular carcinoma, so we'll, I'll call this liver cancer just uh, for ease, is that they have underlying um, insults to their liver, um, which makes the liver inflamed and it causes a medical condition called cirrhosis. And the reason cirrhosis becomes, and, sorry, and then the cirrhosis then becomes liver cancer. So the biggest reasons in the world for getting liver cancer are the infectious diseases, hepatitis B and C. Um, in the UK, though, we um, essentially see, um, we're, we're starting to see a lot less of these patients because now we could cure hepatitis C, uh, though patients with underlying cirrhosis can still get liver cancer. But we're also seeing cirrhosis because of excess alcohol use. And another real phenomenon that we're seeing now is cirrhosis and liver cancer due to obesity and fatty liver disease. Um, it's a lot more common than, um, than the infectious causes in my practice. Now, we are getting better at treating earlier stage liver cancer, which is a relief. And that's because if someone has cirrhosis, we tend to put them on a particular surveillance program to spot if they have cancers. And if they do then have early stage cancer, so they're normally screened every six months, then they are able to undergo an operation or an ablation or radiotherapy. And actually there is a role and a significant role for immunotherapy in liver cancer as well. One thing that I have to say that does worry me about liver cancer is there we're now seeing more and more patients who don't have cirrhosis getting liver cancer. And what they all have in common, unfortunately, is that they all have fatty liver disease or they have obesity. And these patients, unfortunately, tend to almost present universally as stage four liver cancer. And we can offer these patients immunotherapy and other cancer drugs, but um, as we've discussed before, because it is stage four, there's a limited lifespan for these patients. Thank you so much for talking about this and uh, the obesity and its causes and the infections as well. Because generally, particularly in certain community like ours, we put it liver cancer means it's because consuming uh, too much alcohol. But that's not always true. And I'm glad as an expert, you came and talked about it. And it is becoming more common with, uh, you know, to link to obesity. So I think um, it's important for everyone to understand, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think, you know, um, you know, obesity and cancer is a huge topic because, um, you know, I see it from the liver cancer angle. Um, but actually, patients who have obesity and then unfortunately develop cancer, um, their cancers tend to be more aggressive um, and their prognosis 
prognosis seemed to be worse. So I've seen patients um, with breast cancer who have um, estrogen dependent breast cancer. And as you know, um, you know, estrogen is converted from, from fat. So therefore, unfortunately, making it worse, we see it with colorectal patients as well. I think obesity has a linked over 10 different types of cancers. Thank you so much. Maybe we should get you back on the show to talk about that in particular, because I think it's, it is, uh, whether we like it or not, obesity is becoming a huge problem. And if it is linked to um, certain cancers as well, and, and the prognosis of it, even if you're detected, then I think it's worth having a um, talk about it. Thank you. Absolutely. As an expert in the field of liver cancer, are there any new exciting treatments or are, and are there any different types of liver cancer? You mentioned one, and I know there might be a huge long list, which I'm not aware of it, but just uh, for us to know. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so I've, I've probably already touched on this, but I'll expand uh, on a couple of points. Um, so we've mentioned that immunotherapy has a role in liver cancer, and it's now the first line treatment for um, patients that we can't offer surgery or radiotherapy for. Um, there are also um, other medications um, which work specifically on the cancer cells. So we call these TKIs. I won't go too much into the science of it, but um, you know we have at least a couple of different lines of therapy there. But because it's such a common cancer worldwide, there are there is actually um, a lot of different research uh, still going on it. So um, because we're in the NHS, we're kind of playing you know a bit of catch up. But there are different types of immunotherapy. Um, you know, that has been positive in these sort of patients. And we are trialing out um, different sorts of combinations of immunotherapy and other drugs for liver cancer patients. Um, I'll touch a, a bit about cholangiocarcinoma, so biliary tract cancers, which we also call cholangiocarcinoma. So these, unfortunately, are, are rarer cancers. There are about 2,000 cases a year in the UK. It's much commoner actually in parts of Asia because um, of the you know, presence of liver flukes, which are worms that sit in your liver um, and agitate them. And with these cancers, unfortunately, even if they're detected early, are quite aggressive and the prognosis is quite short, but actually there's been a recent positive trial of immunotherapy that seems to have um, got patients living almost, you know, uh, you know, six to twelve months longer at uh, two years, um, which hopefully will get licensed on the NHS. But we're still waiting to see if that's the case. Um, but actually, in that particular tumor, it's not as exciting as as the bigger commoner liver cancer, though there are some interesting uh, treatments for subsets of those patients. Thank you so much. But not, I think it's like four weeks uh, back, one of our own speakers um, talked about uh, she, they had to raise 40,000 uh, pounds for some treatment for the cancer because it was not available under nature. Is that the case? I mean, all the, I take it, all the medications which are really effective perhaps is not available and then it's just still. Yeah, so I, I have to say, I mean, um, I'm someone that probably practices both in the public and private sector. And what I have to say is that I find that the, the most effective therapies are available in the NHS. Um, there may be, I mean, I can't comment on this specific case because unfortunately I don't um, know about it but um, there may be you know some subsets of patients who may benefit 
from a particular condition that the NHS might not cover. And, you know, unfortunately, um, the private sector would have to raise it. I, I mean, I could think of a particular condition in one of the cancers I treat where, um, you know, there's a particular mutation in, in biliary tract cancers that has a very good response rate to um, targeted therapy, but unfortunately it's still not licensed in the NHS, but there are ways to get it in the private sector. Um, but I would still say that the NHS is still very good at delivering the most effective therapies first. But then it probably comes back to the beginning of the show where actually we kind of want to detect and prevent these cancers earlier. So then we don't rely on actually incredibly expensive drugs that on the whole may not offer that much survival benefit to patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumar. Pancreatic cancer is, I know, another field you are interested in and specialized in. I personally know a few people uh, close to me who have lost very close family members within a very short period of time after being detected with pancreatic cancer. So why is pancreatic cancer so hard to treat? Yeah. Um, where can I start? Um, it's probably the deadliest cancer in humans. And there's um, a multitude of valid scientific reasons why it's very hard. I think, you know, early detection is definitely an important issue here because the pancreas is one of the deepest organs in the body. So if there was a lump growing, um, you wouldn't be able to just feel it in your pancreas. Um, but actually, it's got a very unique mix of circumstances where actually it has quite difficult genetics. Um, it has, most of the tumor itself isn't tumor. It's also a disease that tends to spread very early, even if um, you catch it early. So we commonly see patients who have an operation for a one to two centimeter tumor, and they have liver disease already within six months or so after their operation. So, you know, it's unfortunately biologically a more aggressive therapy sorry, a biologically more aggressive disease. And I think really the key to this isn't just going to be detected early, it's just that, that we need better drugs that don't exist today to help treat this. Now, you know, the treatment has got slightly better because there are patients living several months longer now. And in relative terms, that is a success for pancreatic cancer. Um, but actually, there's still a very long way to go in this in this particular disease. Um, I think that sort of treatments we're going to have that are eventually going to beat this disease probably haven't even been invented yet, or maybe in very early development. Thank you so much. I think you rightly said closing the circle is better to go back to preventing than intervening or curing. You have said many things, including liver cancer, immunotherapy, and pancreatic cancer. We have shared so much of information. If the audience want to go away from here, at least with five points, they must remember and they must share with other people what would they do. Five points, did you say? Um... Well, I guess, you know, don't smoke, um, you know, um, stick to a balanced diet and healthy weight, be vigilant about, you know, symptoms. Um, if you do get symptoms, see a doctor early. And I guess the fifth point is, regardless of what, whatever you do, you can't also stay up and worry about what disease you may get and you know just go out and enjoy life as well because you know 
if it's not cancer, that's going to get you relevant to something else. Thank you so much. Your contribution has been really helpful because this is a very important topic. Many of us are still wanting to know and learn about. So thank you so much. And uh, by contacting you, I know that how busy you can be. So, that, so th again, once again, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, sharing this information. Can I ask you one last question? What has been your experience on the show and what do you think? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's been great. Uh, the opportunity especially to reach out to many people. I know you have a very wide um, social reach and um, I hope that some of the information I've shared with the audience today has been useful, at least education um, to yourself. So thank you for inviting me on. Thank you so much. So following tradition, I'm going to announce the next week's speaker before we go into other things. Next week, we are going to be talking about osteoporosis and bone health with Dr. Navaratnam. I'm sure he doesn't need much introduction. Um, Dr. Senior Navaratnam, he's an old school of Mahajana College Telepala in Sri Lanka, former medical registrar, Royal Free Hospital London, former senior at University College Hospital London, and consultant rheumatologist in NHS for 42 years. And he's still engaged in private practice after all this time. So looking forward to Dr. Navratnam coming and talking about osteoporosis and bone health. Um, we have had a small glitch, so I am, I don't know. How, Dr. Navratnam, uh, would you uh, like to give a vote of thanks for us, please? I'm very privileged to listen to Shivan Shivakumar, whose family I know and his father was a friend of mine. Shivakumar himself is a classmate of, of was a classmate of my son in the university. And I have been proud to see that he is in a prestigious Oxford University as a consultant in oncology. And I've always been talking to my son about him. And I enjoyed Dr. Shiva Kumar's talk very much. Although I'm a medical practitioner, rheumatologist, and a bit of immunology uh, knowledge as well. But I found his new information very interesting. And he has gone further than what I can think about immunotherapy, immunology of cancers, and his experience in liver cancer and uh, pancreatic cancer. And I learned something new about obesity and fatty liver. We used to think, oh, fatty liver, slightly increased enzymes, but not to worry with what we tell the patients. But we now know that obesity itself can, fatty liver can lead to liver cirrhosis and hepatoma, which is something new. And thank you so much. I'm sure your talk will enlighten a lot of people because Menaka show goes on YouTube and is viewed by seven, several people. And we'll be listening to it again if we have not understood. And, uh, and I thank you all. Thank Shivon on behalf of Meet Menaka and all those who joined us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ordam. Um, apologies, I put him in the spot last minute because the person who was supposed to do the vote of thanks had, uh, you know, her internet connection got cut off. <laughs> so yeah. thank you so much. I really, really I appreciate that. For people who are on the Zoom, please hold on. You will be able to ask a question directly to Dr. Shiva Kumar in a minute. For people who are listening to us, on Facebook. Thank you so much as ever for all the support. Hoping to see some of you on our um, in-person event on the 3rd of December. So please do support us and come along and enjoy the day. Till we see you 
next time, same space, same time, to talk about osteoporosis and bone health with Dr. Srini and Ratna. Have a good weekend. Stay safe, be happy, and keep smiling.